white tree blooming right now, more than likely, since you all are vegetable, edible kind of folks, more than likely, that's going to be an apple tree. Because they go into bloom the end of, end of May. And that's why apples and pears uh, produce fruit more consistently than, let's say, apricots or nectarines or peaches, some of the pitted fruits. Because it blooms so late in April, it gets it out of the risk of frost. So many of the uh, apricots, they, they, were, they were killed, not killed, the trees are <laughs> fine, but the fruit was taken last week. Yeah. Because of that, remember that uh, cold wind, just we frosted like three times last week, that would have taken the fruit. Apples and pears, they just decided to open up this week. And so they're out of that risk of frost. So this is called a triple play. What we did is we took three fruit trees, three apples, we planted them in a cluster, Three trees, you plant one, one cluster, like an aspen cluster, into a hole, and then there's three different apples, so you're harvesting the Fujis at once. When they're just about done harvesting those, you get the delicious, or you go for the whatever the three uh, apples are. So now they pollinate each other, so it gets you bigger fruits and more fruits, and it's just pretty, just unusual to see a tree like this. So I brought that one instead of a regular something boring. I'm talking to gardeners. So I gotta, can't have the normal, you gotta have something different. And then someone brought a picture of this. It went into bloom in our test gardens across the street uh, today. So it went into full bloom. This is a rock rose. Yeah, got it. It's a uh, native, drought hardy, tough as nails. Animals don't eat it. They are not interested. Avelina, deer, rabbit. It just grows about knee high. Um, about knee high, kind of mounding like this. Uh, just, you count it to bloom, end of, end of April through May, first part of June. Long, long bloom cycle. So again, cliff, rock rose. I want to call it cliff rose. Okay. <laughs> cliff rose is blooming too. But yes, it is. That's the yellow one, the yellow native flower. Just remember this. The last frost date, you want to write this down, is May 9th. The locals use Mother's Day as the demarcation line for planting your summer plants. Before that, you're planting, we, we've been harvesting kale and arugula and uh, rhubarb and you know, uh, cabbage and lettuce, all the leafy things for months. Uh, but we have not planted our summer things yet. We'll go over why, or that's mainly because of the frost. We'll go show you how to cheat and warm things up without having a greenhouse as well before we're all done with this. And then the, the first frost of the year is October 29th. Uh, generally, we use Halloween as the first frost. So your uh, Brandywine tomatoes, your uh, anything with their name big in it, tomato. You know, tomatoes like this big, the huge slicers. Uh, they will be green covered and frost is coming. You've not picked one yet. So you gotta be, be aware of that and watch that so you know when to cover them or when to pick them and ripen them indoors, that kind of stuff. But I think it's really nice here, oh. um, we have a couple of uh, vegetable growing seasons. So uh, we're just kind of ending to, that spring growing season where kids we'll said sure you're growing your lettuces, kales, uh, spinach, all that kind of stuff. And the other great thing about that is you can grow those again in the fall. Yeah. So come September, go ahead, grow your lettuces again, your kales, your spinaches, because then you can get another crop, broccoli, cauliflower. So you can actually get two seasons of your cool season vegetables, which is terrific. Uh, but your warm seasons, yeah, you get one chance. Uh, now, I don't know if you've tried to dig a hole yet in the ground. <laughs> Our ground is beyond terrible. It's, it's atrocious. So you're really going to have to heavily amend your soil if you're going to garden, especially with these things we're talking about today. It takes a tremendous amount of energy, water, moisture, food uh, to, to create a tomato, lettuce, celery, uh, to, to produce this kind of, of crop that you're going to harvest and hopefully it keeps doing it. So we'll go over food, how to do it, but you're really going to, some of you are going to try to garden in our soil for about two years. It seems like about two years. <laughs> then you go, I'm at it! And you put it in a raised bed or you start doing container gardens or you're trying to bring in the soil that, that can actually grow in. Um, 
With that being said, we do a lot of square foot gardening where we crop rotate a smaller area. We get a lot of produce out of a small area by starting in into February, March 1st. Still frosty, there's still snow, but lettuce and, and uh, cauliflower and all the leafy things love that. In fact, the flavor is better when it's a bright day, a cold night. That's when you get the best tasting kales, uh, spinach, uh, 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 Brussels sprouts, uh, broccoli, those things taste better when it's cool. So you'll start that, you'll start your peas very, very early. The peas are already up and really growing like crazy right now. So when the peas are done, you've harvested those, you'll take that same row, you'll plant your beans. Beans are a summer plant. And again, this will be in that calendar that I send you. It'll tell, help you to strategize, when do I take this out? Put this in. So that's square foot gardening. And you'll get more and more familiar with that crop rotation. We do a lot of container gardens. Mm -hmm. we, we grow, we probably have, I'm afraid to look, count. There's over 50 containers, not just little containers, not pots. I'm talking containers where we plant things. So she just brought home another three or four, I don't know. Can't count, can't keep up. But they're all on irrigation. Uh, the, the, the clock runs them, waters them. Uh, we've got our professional grade potting soil, mm -hmm. water's potting soil, that's our growers mix, is filled with that. So we will frequently put in tomatoes with alyssum or something. So we, we make art out of our edibles. There's nothing more beautiful than a tomato by the front door with fruits on it. You want to inspire guests and friends and family <laughs> with some flowers around the edge of it? That's inspirational. Oh, definitely. It can be, I love it when they, uh, containers, when they're mixing edibles with ornamentals. I just think it's such an attractive look and so practical. Uh, because if you've got a beautiful tomato going and you want to encourage pollination, because maybe it's just not getting pollinated enough, you can throw uh, something like the lobularia around it, a little daisy. So these are going to encourage your pollinators to come by, your moss, your butterflies, the little bees that help pollinate. So you're getting, you're kind of doing that double whammy thing where you're getting beauty and you're gonna get good fruit production because you're encouraging pollinators to come in. Sometimes that's half the battle with vegetable gardening is, you know, people go, well, I've got lots of flowers, but I don't get any fruit. Well, it's not getting pollinated. <laughs> so you can either go out with your hands and, you know, take a little paintbrush and dab it. Who has that kind of time? It's better to put some nice pollinators around your veggies to really encourage them to come in. And it makes it pretty. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's face it, vegetables, they're not the prettiest plant in the world. They're high maintenance, they get disease, spots. Uh, we love to put flowers in with our raised beds. We'll put uh, uh, creeping rosemary over the edge of a raised bed because it's just pretty, it's evergreen, and it blooms, helps pollinate. You can pick it and use it in the herb or on the barbecue. Uh, uh, lavenders, we have those in big red pots. They're just glorious, evergreen or ever blue, whatever color. Show them that one uh, English lavender I brought. Lavenders do really well. Your herbal plants do better here than anywhere else in the country. It loves the high altitude, the brightness of the sun, and then we're dry. So we don't get a lot of the diseases get in a more humid climate like the south, the northwest, or uh, some of those really humid areas, mm -hmm. which herbs don't like that. They'll tend to get black leaves and have issues. Here they don't. Right. And animals don't eat herbs. I don't know why. You would think they would, but they don't touch this plant. Uh, we've got, I don't know how many varieties we've got them. There are probably uh, 10 different varieties of, of, of There's a Spanish um, fruit or lavender for everybody because yeah. it's, there's a bunch down there. And, and Ken is right. I mean, the critters do not like lavenders and rosemaries and mints and thyme. So it is also another good thing to put around your veggies. So if you have critters that want to come in and nibble, uh, putting those herbs selectively around can kind of keep them out of the desirables. Uh, so they won't be eating your tomatoes and your zucchini and all that good stuff. So what the book says, it just covers soil real quick. What the book says, just quote some encyclopedia stuff. Every year you should add a two to three inch layer of organics. A lot of folks who use manures, compost, composted mulch material. Two inch layer, 
uh, turned into the soil one shovel's depth, or one rotor tiller's depth. Does that make sense? So if you've got a virgin plot, it's never been worked before, it's just had weeds and wildflowers, and it's never been turned, it may take you two, three years to get that soil where it's actually viable. I mean, it'll produce some year one, they'll produce more year two, and they'll produce even more year three. So every year, what we do with our containers is we want to add fresh soil, fresh potting soil every year. So I'll take that top layer of that, what was growing last year, because those old roots and stuff is in there. And it's lost its viability. It's lost its, uh, Oh, juice. bigger, yeah, it's used. <laughs> the soil actually gets worn out. So we take that, maybe not replace all of the soil in a bigger pot, in a small pot we replace all of them. We'll take that soil and we dump that into our raised beds. We top off the raised beds. So we're always rotating our soils. So we're, we're, we're actively trying to make room for new, fresh soil. Uh, let me tell you a dirty secret. Should we tell them this? <laughs> uh, so, you print a bag and it says potting soil on it. Now you can shove anything you want in that and it's still called potting soil on the bag. This is where the, the industry takes the most shortcuts. A good quality potting soil has a lot of peat moss in it. It makes it more acidic, adds drainage, uh, allows the plants to root yet breathe, yet it's one of the most expensive ingredients. If you're Home Depot, we call it Home Dumpo here, or Lucifer's Lowe's. Oh. We say that on air. Yes, we can. Anyway, there are main competitors. We, it's not Mortimer or the other folks. It's, it's not Earthworks. It's the boxes. Those are the predators. Uh, anyway, we go in there and, and they take the shortcuts on that to meet a price point. They'll take the perlite out, those little white specks. That's like magic juice for soils because it, it adds air into the soil so that it doesn't so the roots don't, they, they don't suffocate, they don't drown. And so you get that recipe right, and the plants just take off. You get the recipe wrong, let's say with miracle Grow potting soil, stay away from that garbage. It's terrible soil. I know they got a marketing company that, that promotes them like crazy. They're the number one seller by far, but had more clients kill plants with miracle Grow junk. So be careful with that stuff. It stays too wet in our climate. And so your plants won't root, and they just don't take off. It's a fine line to have a soil that stays moist, yet breathes. That's what you want. And so we created our own soil. We got so frustrated, we brought it. Lift that up over your head. Oh, Three times. <laughs> we created our own soil. This is our grower's mix. When we start seedlings, cuttings, uh, it, you can start a seed with that. But it's made to plant directly into, not to cut it with anything else. So I always try to add some of that fresh in the top layer, or I'll try to add some of that in the, in the raised bed. If you've got a brand new raised bed, fill it with the stuff from the soil companies. They've got a gardener mix. Basically they go and they dig out stock tanks, which is heavy silt, and they get some free manure from Chino Valley. They throw that in there, and they get some wood chips from the city, and that's their gardener mix. It's not the best. I've set up a lot of community gardens where maybe it's a good filler, but I would take the top layer where the roots are going to be, put the potting soil. Put a good potting soil in that top layer. So now, when you take that new eggplant, put that in there, it's the same soil. When plants see a different soil, they're not happy. They like the same every time. Roots don't transition from one soil to the next. So if you get the same kind of soil surrounding that root, it'll just go, whoop, search to root out. So, Ken, if they're doing a raised bed, how, how, what depth would you encourage them? That's a good question. So the book says eight inch, so one cinder block or one block, uh, which you'll do most of your crops. What I find is tomatoes, your deeper rooted crops, they prefer to more. I'd say at least 12 inch to 16 if you can would be ideal for potatoes. Uh, giant, I love growing giant pumpkins. They love more soil. I mean, I like a pumpkin that's you can yeah. barely lift. You're rolling to the front door and go, look what I grow! And then by Thanksgiving, you're going, I'm tired of this thing! Uh, what do I do with it? Oh, fit the trash can! Uh, anyway, it's, uh, they like deeper. So if in doubt, go a little bit deeper. 
Uh, but minimum, I would say, would be eight inch. Because most of these plants, including, I mean, carrots, uh, we don't grow deep carrots here because the soil is so terrible. They go down and they start to, they just go like, I can't get down there unless you bring in your own soil. Then it, then it can get deeper. Generally, we're growing shorter carrots just because we have such little soil. Some of you have no soil, literally zero. You've got dead soil. The top soil that was on your property, they brought the backhoe in day one, scraped it all off, put it to the side, and then built your house, your driveway, your patios, and your footers and stuff. So some of you have no viability in your soil. Not one worm. You won't see one when you dig. No mycorrhizal fungi. No, nothing beneficial that creates life in the soil. And that's the magic that makes the plants grow. So it's really all about soil. So say you have your raised bed or you're doing containers or even in the ground, what would you put in in addition, like other additives? Oh yeah, good. Thanks for teeing me up on that. Okay. Yeah. She's I guiding don't. me actually. It's just her way of saying, get on with the program. Uh, <laughs> so when I'm turning that, that uh, uh, compost, one shovel step, I'm the lazy gardener. I mean, I'm the guy that gets the soil prepped while she goes and plants it. I get the irrigation ready, she goes and plants it. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll add that compost, manures, whatever I've got. Probably at this point, if you've not turned your soil, it's a little late for manures, because you want those things to settle some. If you were to add manure into your soil right now and then plant you know, later this weekend, it may be too hot, maybe too, might burn. Really manures, you want to rest so that they have time to, to, to level out. So I would use mulch. Water's mulch is screened down to a quarter inch minus. It's real fine. It's a compost that will not burn. You're trying to change the structure of that soil. In addition, before I turn it, I'll add the all-purpose plant food. Show that. I feel like Vanna White. <laughs> and you look like, too. If only had that white uh, studded dress. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh, that would yeah. twirl. And then gypsum, I'll add, we forgot that. Oh, we forgot the gypsum. I, I add gypsum and I add this. And I'll turn it to one shovel's depth. That's what I do with my mulch, all at the same time. Uh, what this does, this is nutrients, it's adding food. And the main ingredient is cottonseed meal in that, in that particular fertilizer. You'll smell, it smells kind of earthy, kind of organic. Uh, that's the cottonseed meal. But that creates really good fruits, I mean, big fruits. And it changes very acidic, so it changes, keeps the pH down. Uh, the the uh, gypsum, that is actually calcium sulfate. We have a problem here called blossom end rot, where the tomato actually, where the blossom was, will actually rot out, so it's like a black spot. You'll see it on your peppers, you'll see it on your squashes. Uh, that's almost always a calcium deficiency. If you know that, you know it's going to come and it's a problem. I put I put gypsum where my where those crops are going to be, where the tomatoes, peppers, uh, eggplants have had problems with that. I'll put some gypsum in that area so it's, it's the least expensive form of calcium there is. Uh, and I'll blend that down. Even when I plant, when I plant a new tomato, like, uh, like this, what is this? This is a oh, uh, celebrity tomato. I'll plant this, I'll sprinkle some gypsum at the bottom of that hole so the roots grow through that gypsum. It picks up the calcium. It really cuts down on my blossom and rot. And it creates a nice, I think it's a better tasting fruit. Uh, really, part of our problem is our water is extremely alkaline. So what you'll find is as you water, especially when we get closer to June where you're watering every day, uh, the plants, some of, some of the plants will start to turn yellow on you. The leaves on the inside will get kind of a yellow tinge. That's always pH has crept too high. So your soil is starting to take on the pH of your water. So you've got to always try to counteract that. That's the beauty of the uh, all-purpose plant food. The cottonseed meal makes it more acidic. Um, so your peat, your potting soil, is peat moss, makes it more acidic. So we have this bag of yeah, that's good. cubic acid. Perfect. Would that be something to yeah. mix in as well? Yeah, absolutely. And Especially you seedlings. Use containers too. Uh huh. I always use it in my raised beds. Containers, I would think you could get it too much. <laughs> humic acid, if you boil, that's what that is, called humic, humic acid. Uh, if you take a compost pile and you boil it down, you just compost right down to this last element, the last element is humic acid, that. 
So it feeds not the plant, it feeds the soil. So the worms come in and go, oh, this is great, wow. You, it it uh, populates your, your mycorrhizal colonies, the beneficials that help break down the, the uh, organics, the manures, that kind of stuff. So it's great stuff, especially where you're putting carrots. Uh, the seed, if you're doing seedlings, it's like magic. Uh, lawns, I wouldn't recommend you put a lawn out without that, I see. So that's what the, the uh, human does. Do you have like sewer manure you put in and then you have to get it time? Can you plant the right 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 away? Yeah, it doesn't burn. You don't have to wait. Yeah, it doesn't burn at all. It's not a nitrogen base. It doesn't feed the plant, it feeds the soil. So that's the magic of it. Kind of an oddball or specialty product that only gardeners are going to know about uh, because it's, it's because of how it reacts. <laughs> Everyone knows a chemical based Scott's petroleum based chemical fertilizer, feeding the plants, so put it on, see the green. It may not be the best for the soils and the longevity of your bird in the back. Is it, is it good for uh, tomatoes? Is it good for tomatoes? Absolutely great for tomatoes. This stuff you're talking about. Yeah. Humic. Yeah. It's, it's fabulous for the vegetable bird. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, if you've got some borderline, like I don't know if my nutrients are good enough in my soil, or it just isn't producing like it did in the past, I would add some of that. Because it's going to up your, your uh, nutrient uptake of the, from the plant. Are you I think we got it. it. The soil in the beds, or I bring the soil, and then that on top? So this I generally go on top. On top of yeah. the Yeah, I just sprinkle on top of the soil. Yeah. The old yeah. Anywhere I've got soil, the plant's going to grow. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the soil in first. I'll plant the plant in my fertilizer, my, my gypsum. I'll blend all that together. I'll plant my plants. Uh, and then I'll add some of this on top. And so, then what's the top layer of dirt? Top layer of dirt is just whatever is showing on the dirt. Oh, uh, that is a good question, though. Sometimes, how do you keep weeds down? So we do get some weeds. We're windy, especially as we're planting, to so get weeds, seed coming in, foxtail. Uh, uh, tumbleweed are starting to blow around now. When they blow, the seed go everywhere. Uh, a good idea, um, put a newspaper, newspaper layer down, just one sheet, and then put shredded cedar bark on top of that, and you will not have weeds. Holds the moisture in, keeps the weeds out. You can get sophisticated with, uh, with like weed fabrics and stuff. Then you gotta pull all that stuff up. I find I just till in the newspaper and I till in the, the last year's uh, cedar bark. And the benefit of, of shredded cedar, cedar repels insects. So you won't have as many earwigs or potato bugs or things that crawl across the ground and get on the, through that bark. They're not going to like that. There's so, something about cedar oil that repels bugs. Okay, and I think we have one more thing, the soil. Yeah, I like I think the reason I'm kind of making Ken hit on soil is because if you have a bad soil, you're going to have an unhappy plant. So that soil prep, is, it's important to put the time and the energy and the money into it. Because if you don't, and you put one of these little wonderful tomatoes or eggplants in, it's going to be unhappy. And you're not going to get good production. So do some work ahead of time. And it saves you money and heartache and anger. You can talk about that if you want. You're so good at it. Yeah. You explain it well. I brought oh this. I brought this mainly because I know there's a lot of raised beds, a lot of containers. There's just a lot of those here. For us, in our raised bed, we just put two new huge pots on either side of the driveway. I mean, they're impressive. Mm -hmm. They're ox blood red, huge uh, shrubs, and not necessarily veggies there yet. Could be. There's a couple holes. But uh, basically, um, I filled those up as far as I could with water's potting soil. Planted all the plants in that. But that top layer of that pot, these are pots that are as big as your, they're, they're resort size. I mean, they don't get dwarfed by the garage door. They, they make a statement. I knew they were going to be hot. It's a south-facing wall. I knew they were going to be hard to water, even if I've got drip irrigation. So what I did is, the top layer where the roots were going to be growing, I added some Aqua Boost crystals. This is a, a product we make here in the store. Uh, they're polymer crystals. So they swell up and hold like 200 times their weight in water, if you know what polymers are. It's, a, it's an ag product. Uh, sometimes at the fair, they'll make neckerchiefs that kind of, kind of soak and they swell up and they, they hold water. That's what this is, okay? 
So they hold water, and then we infuse the crystals with mycorrhizal fungi. These are beneficial, it's the good guys, not the bad guys. It's hard to explain mycorrhizals, uh, but they actually occur, they tickle the feet of plants, so they want to root deeper. So mainly it takes the water pressure off, you'll cut it, you'll cut your water bill by half. You'll use half the amount of water. And some of you, you're not gardeners, you're waterers. Your hobby is the hose. You love sitting there out there with your coffee and going, that's therapy for you. I love it. I'm there with you sometimes. Uh, you will kill plants if you use this with that kind of water. You have to actively cut back on the water. Well, for raised beds and containers, if you travel a lot, this is the best stuff ever. Uh, so it really is noticeable how much, how much longer you can go in between the water cycles before you got to rewater again. So it's a game changer for things that get kind of wilty. Sometimes your tomatoes, they get wilty at the end of the day. This will keep that from happening. Sometimes your peppers are super crazy hot. I mean, just like a jalapeno you grew somewhere else, it was sweet almost. Here it's like burn your face off and your wife's face <laughs> off. I mean, they're just so hot. That's the only thing that does that is it gets stress. It gets uh, water stress. That's when a pepper gets crazy hot. Well, this will take that off so you get sweeter, more consistent watering. So you don't get stress in plants. The aqua boost is a great. I, at the beginning of every season, every year, I buy the biggest one of the quart size, and it's, just, it's on my garden shelf. And I, every time I plant a tree or a shrub or a vegetable, I always add some of this at the bottom of the plant to pull it Okay, yes? Is it possible to add it to something that's already planted? It's harder. Yes, you can add it to something that's already been planted. It's harder because how do you get it underneath the roots? Generally, you'll take a piece of rebar, a big, big uh, screwdriver. You'll, you'll try to sprinkle it in a bowl that way. That's how you get it into a house plant. You'll take a pencil and try to open it up and try to sprinkle it in. If you're taking that cruise with the Panama Canal, you'll be gone for three weeks. How do your plants get, get, uh, make it that far? That's, that's how you get that in there. And it does, now you've got to actually change the way you water them, because it will reduce the amount of frequency of water you need to use for that plant. So her question was, how do you uh, keep track of the watering then? How do you know if it needs more water or you need to cut back? And there is no better way than just to stick your fingers in the yep. soil. Um, because then you can tell. You can tell, oh my gosh, it's really, really dry. Or you pull it out and it's got mud all over it. Then you need to cut back. So this is your just touch. And you're looking at your plants. Your plants will talk to you too. Uh, you know, if they're there and they're in the sun and they're just like, look, please, water them. You know, you know. But if they're there and they're soft, they turn yellow, that yellowing, they just kind of go, Whoa. you're watering too much. And yes, it is possible to water too much. I would say it's more likely for you all to water too much than too little, especially if you're gardening in the ground. Because our clay, we mainly have clay soils. Even you folks out in Williamson Valley, you've got more of that crushed granite stuff. But there's a hard pan about 18 inches down that just water hits and just stays there. So you're more prone to water. Plants need to breathe in between the water cycles. Yeah. And I don't really want to go into watering. Too yeah, because that's a scary. Get a water meter. <laughs> we just we have a whole class on nothing but watering. Yeah. I would say what what I do myself, just my professional eye. I love test victims or canary in the coal mine. I love, I love to put like squash, is it, or is this a cucumber? Whatever it is, this is a squash. Squash are very talkative. If they get dry or stressed at all, they're just big crybabies. You are so hot. They start to wilt, and they, they're talking to you going, and you just water, and they go, okay, I'm fine. So look for certain plants are more talkative than others. Look to those, you say, oh, that's about, like, I got three days before I had to water again. Oh, I'm going to go. I try to max out as many days as I can before I have to rewater. But eventually, some of those plants in that garden are going to get talkative and look for those. So, in my uh, flower beds, I use pansies. Biggest, the name pansy, I don't know where <laughs> they're tough as nails in the winter, but if they get dry or they're so emotional, they just like live out on their stuff and they just like to show off. If they get cold, they lay down. If they get dry, they lay down. If anything happens, they lay down. 
<laughs> and then they get happy and they just go, okay, I'm happy. So that's my winter, spring thing. So um, I have a question about like sunlight. So the biggest thing I get asked a lot is yeah. how much sun do they need? Uh, if they get some shade, is it okay? So where is it? How many hours do vegetables need of sunlight? And if they get some shade, is it okay? Or is shade not a good thing? No, I think uh, now our sun is more intense. You know that, right? So we're a mile up in the air. There's less atmosphere. So it's like like we're right at the sun. Uh, so six hours or more of mountain sun is considered full sun. Six hours or more. Now in the Midwest, it's like all day is full sun. Here, it's different. We, we've got clear skies and we're high altitude. It's just more intense. Uh, I, I would think there's some seasonality to it. I find that your leafy things, your spring, early spring things, they do great full sun. Going into the growing season, though, as we get closer to June when it's hot, they prefer some shade. They actually do better in the shade. You know, when your when your lettuce starts to bolt, uh, the flavor goes off. It's more bitter. It's, it's just not as sweet as it was. Spinach will start to flower, uh, which is never good for your leafy things. You want them not to flower. But if you put them in more of the shade, they are less prone to bolt. You get a longer. And you get a longer growing season. Yeah, definitely. So it just depends. If you're doing square foot gardening, don't put the corn on the south side so it shades all the other vegetables. Put it on the put it on the north side so it grows up behind. So there's some strategy with it. And you're going to make some mistakes. That's called gardening. That's how you learn to. You're trying to make mistakes generally in the right directions, and that's what we're trying to do here. Is just get you enough a few seed to get you started in the right direction. That's a bad one. <laughs> Do the tomatoes go on one side, you put your squash on the edge. Uh, is there a rule or a way to set up your waste bed? Whatever feels right. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's what I in my raised in the raised beds, or even in a big pot, I'll put a big tomato, maybe two, coming out with a cage at the front edge. Often you'll have cucumbers, something that drapes over, so I get more capacity, more produce out of that square foot of gardening. Uh, uh, the giant pumpkins, I always put the, the tomatoes and squash and things in that raised bed, and on the edges, I'll just get a six pack and I kind of tuck it wherever there's an open spot right at the edge, and I train those things to grow out into the landscape. It looks like Jurassic Park landed by the time we get done, like the garden went Berserk and spilled over, but I get more square footage that way. And I don't want a pumpkin that weighs 200 pounds in the middle of my garden. I want it out over here, not not here, so it doesn't take up so much room. And then I can also get a pallet in and kind of hold it up, keep it from touching soil, keep it from rotting, keep it. And I don't enter them in the fair. I just like growing pumpkins because they're funky and they're weird. They're they're fun. It's impressive to watch a pumpkin grow like this in the summer. So what about crop rotation? So if you have a raised bed, and last year you put your tomatoes on the west side and they did beautiful, do you want to go tomatoes back in the same spot or is it you should switch it out? So vertinella wilt, that's the most common, this is across the country, it's where a tomato gets real wilty, the leaves will start to curl up and it will drop its blossoms, drop its fruit. Very, very common, vertinella wilt. Uh, it's a disease, it's generally soil borne, and so if you keep planting your tomatoes in the same spot every year, it's just a matter of time until you have vertinella wilt encroach, get into that soil. The only way to get past that is either put fresh soil in that spot every time or you rotate your crops. So this year I grow tomatoes, next year's peppers, next year's squash. So I, I try to give a rest at least one year before that plant is, that same plant is planted in that same spot. I find that tends to be a problem here. Because we have such little soil, we just plant it the same way every time, and we don't, we get some diseases. And once you get the disease in the soil, you can't, you can't get it out. It's there to stay unless you replace the soil. So this is important or you'll have issues down the road. Petunias. Petunias have, have a disease that gets in the soil. If you plant petunias every year in the same spot, every year, eventually you're going to get this 
wilting, it's a disease, it gets in the soil. Once in the soil, you can't, there's nothing you can do except replace the soil or never plant petunias in there again. Marigolds, no problem. Well, that's a no problem. Geraniums, petunias, every time you plant petunias in that spot, or tomatoes for good for health, well, you'll have issues. Should we go over the, let's go over the blossom set, oh, okay. tomatoes. Now you should mention this funky new tomato. That is really cool. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I wanted the rot stop. Rot this, stop yeah, the blossom head rot. What you'll find, this is this is just what I do. Okay, I, I love tomatoes. We're salsa gardeners. We love pico de gallo. We love onions. We love herbs, mm -hmm. uh, tomatoes. Uh, we eat it off. We can live off that. Nothing else. Uh, and whatever comes off the grill, that's our thing. We love to do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what I do, uh, the reason I do it, our nights are so cold, there's such a huge swing between daytime and nighttime, it messes with certain plants, especially your summer plants. I know it won't frost, but the soil is cool right now. So you'll plant tomatoes, you'll plant eggplants and cucumbers and watermelons, and they won't want to grow very much. So they're kind of slow to take off. As we get closer to the middle, to the end of May, the soil warms up and it starts to explode. You just see the difference. Uh, and that swing between day and, and night really messes with the plant. It starts to shut down. It just doesn't want a fruit. It doesn't want to set the, it'll blossom, but it won't set the fruit on the blossom. Very, very common problem. Uh, so what I do every year, I get one of these and one of these every year. I buy a fresh one every year. And what I will start with, as soon as my tomatoes are up tall enough, they start to set blossoms. You know, they're up about a foot, foot and a half, about knee high. They're starting to, to generate fruit. Um, I will start hitting them with blossom set. Blossom set, what this does, you front loaded your soil with so much nutrient that the plant actually forgets to stop at fruit. It just grows new vines, new foliage. And what the blossom set does is it slows the plant down and goes, okay, take a break. I think you need to think about setting some fruit now. So you gotta think like the plant. And so you're not spraying, this, this is a misconception, this is not a pollinator for the flowers. This is a foliage spray for the plant. And it forces it to, to hiccup so that it, it remembers what it's supposed to do, and that is set fruit. So I'll start that about the time it's, I think it should set fruit. You know what that is, not about me how. Every other month, every other week, I spray this on my plants. I just go through it, and I, I feel good about it. Spritz, 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 spritz. Do you use it just on tomatoes? Or I use it on the garden, because it works on everything. But it's, especially you hear it written up on tomatoes and peppers. Those are the most problematic. But if you spray it on pumpkins, on eggplants, whatever, it also helps the fruit get larger and, and set more fruits as well. So it doesn't just work on tomatoes, although the tomatoes are the number one culprit. <coughs> the other week, so once a week I'm spraying something. So one week I'll spray this, the next week I put the rot stop on. This is, uh, rot stop is liquid calcium. It's directly intaked from the foliage. So again, blossom end rot. That's what I'm trying to, to counteract. There's nothing worse than you get this beautiful fruit and half of it's rotten. That's just, that's an insult to me personally as a gardener. That's not right. So I, I spray this, I put gypsum underneath each plant and I spray this on each of my plants. What I find is the flavor gets better. I'll have a better tasting fruit uh, or vegetable and I'll have a better, I'll have a larger uh, uh, fruit when I give it more calcium. So once a week, I'm spraying this or that, and I just go through in the morning, and spritz it on, and I'm, I'm hitting the foliage, specifically the foliage, like a mist. Okay. Yes. What about um, chemicals, though, in those products? Because you know you don't want that in your food that you're eating. Yeah, I don't know that these are. I think this is organic. I don't know. It's calcium. I think that's calcium. Just calcium. Yeah. So, uh, but if that's a worry for you, don't spray it. For me, I, I'm not worried about these because I don't think they're, they're, I'm worried about petroleum and bug killers, insect systemics, I'm worried about those. These I'm less worried. Uh, for, for myself, uh, I'm a hybrid organic gardener. I try to go organic whenever possible. 
All of our vegetables are non-GMO. All of them are organic, organic. That's what we stand for. But when grasshoppers are taking over your garden, sometimes you need to break out the big guns and organics ain't going to happen. That's not going to, we want death. You're going to die now. I want you quivering before my feet now. Stop eating my vegetables. So I'll go after them that way. Uh, but there's ways to counteract. We can keep it organic. Um, this is my number one defense. 100% organic bug spray. It's home harvest. We put th this together years ago. Uh, great for, for uh, mealybugs, the smaller things, thrip, uh, aphids. But also, I've got a real problem. Again, I'm a, I'm a pumpkin and, and a squash grower. Uh, they start to fruit when the monsoons hit. And so I tend to fight in my own gardens powdery mildew. I just, every year, it's powdery mildew, powdery mildew. This is one of the best powdery mildew preventers because it's a, it's a neem oil, it's is the main product. Neem oils, they coat the spores so it can't spread, so it keeps it in check. So I keep it completely organic and not have uh, a powdery mildew that keeps the bugs away. It's got a repelling action, got an odor to it. So you can keep a lot of this stuff very organic. Sometimes you gotta break out the big guns. You get insects or something funky, We've got a microscope downstairs and a huge screen. If you want to see an aphid up close when it's this big, it's freakish. I think they have 10 eyeballs. No, they do have a lot of legs. You look at them like, oh my. Ah! You should talk about your, your new tomato thing. Okay. That is so cool. And then bring that one home. <laughs> that, so, that so uh, I think growers sit around in the wintertime in dark corners. And we get bored like everyone else. <laughs> I've grown that enough. What's new? Yeah, so they're always coming up with new plants. So, and the realization that more and more people are gardening in containers. Yeah. So they're in smaller homes, and maybe they just have a balcony or a small patio. Uh, so they have come to realize, okay, gardeners are growing things in containers, and they don't have an acre to plant their vegetables in. So this is a new tomato that they come up with. It's a dwarf tomato. So it is wonderful for containers because you know a lot of tomatoes, they just, they bind. A lot of your tomatoes just want to bind out. And you get the cages and the next thing you know, the cage is like this because it's gotten too heavy. Yep. So this is a really nice dwarf tomato. The thing about this is it's gonna have, it's got about three different varieties of tomatoes in here. So you're going to have everything from little cherry tomatoes to the great big tomatoes. On the same uh, plant, is that cool or what? So it, it's kind of cool because you never know what you're going to get. So if you, if you like that fun of gardening, uh, this is definitely going to be a fun one because it's going to produce different types of tomatoes on the plant. It's not going to get over, I think it's 30 inches is its yep. maximum. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, so very easy to grow, very easy to control, uh, and you know if it gets if it's June and it's 100 degrees and maybe it's your pot is in too hot a spot, you can kind of move it to where it gets some more shade. Uh, so a great way to have fun growing. That's that's tomatoes. one that size. That's one where I would I would start. I mean I would take it home. I would start yeah. rot stop plus winter. I would just once a week. I would I would spritz the foliage. And, and uh, you know, have better fruits, more bigger fruits, that kind of stuff. So what's your opinion? Because I know people ask. Oh, are you asking my opinion? She uh, never does this at all. Because I know people will ask, can I leave it in this pot? Absolutely, you can leave it in that pot. It's enough you can absolutely do that. You need to watch your watering. So we're going to take that one home. I'm going <laughs> to pop the cage off. And I'll pop the bottom off and I'll plant it in a bigger pot. Just so I don't have to worry. We work for a living. This is this. We're coming to work every day. Uh, it's got more soil. I got more capacity. I got more fudge factor. I can make a mistake. The irrigation miscycles. Um, I, I've got more soil to more sponge for nutrients and water to be a part of. Oh, that's a good idea. There, um, back table back there is called Super Dwarf Tomato Super Dwarf. Super, that's a, they need to come up with a better, a better name. name. We should make it more <laughs> so We can help them with that. Basically, it's a triple play. Is this triple play apple? Three apples in the same? They did that with a tomato. They just grafted three tomatoes out of there. That's pretty cool. I think it's kind of neat. Yeah. The one thing about tomatoes, um, I think it's only true of tomatoes. When you go to plant them, 
they're one of the few plants that'll actually root off the stem. Yep. So you can pull those bottom uh, leaves off and plant it deep. And when you plant it deep, it's going to root out from there. It's going to give you better root structure, so you're going to have a stronger plant. We're taking these home. <laughs> so I would take this, and I would probably plant it. I would probably plant that that deep in the bucket. Uh, so I'd leave this foliage out. I always look for a plant for a tomato that's got a long stem. So all those hairs you see going up and down the stem, those will turn into roots. Only do this with tomatoes. Nothing else or everything else will die. You need the tomato and grapes. Grapes will do that. So grapes and tomatoes I plant deep. Uh, but I'll try to get as much so I'll sprinkle some uh, gypsum underneath this so it picks up the calcium and it'll just start growing. So I get a more, I get a bigger root mass. Uh, that'll be really important as we get into summer monsoon season. It really plays out well for us. Mm -hmm. So I would not do that to this. It's already rooted. It's already got a root ball this big. I would just take the pot off, plant it, pull it, pull it all good. Mm -hmm. While we're on tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, exceptionally well here. They really do well. Medium-sized tomatoes, uh, early girls, celebrity, champion, San Diego. There's a whole bunch of medium-sized tomatoes does exceptionally well. If you're new to gardening, start in the area, start with those. Don't start with the huge, you know, slicing, uh, you know, big boys, brandy wines, those, those things, because they're notorious for starting out slow, and then it'll be about frost time. We're getting into October, you can feel the chill in the air, and it has not fruit, hasn't ripened yet. So you'll be notorious for it's just constant. If you got greenhouses, that's cheating. <laughs> now you can start and it'll actually warm the soil up faster. Why don't you pull up that, that uh, plant, the uh, season starter? We use a lot of these. I should have brought in my, I've shown those off before. I've got probably 20 of these in my house. They last for years and years and years. Uh, but they're like a mini greenhouse around your plant. Every new first plantings, I put those around everything that loves the heat. Eggplants, cucumbers, tomatoes, obviously. So I'll have these green uh, 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 teepees, basically. You fill them up. They used to be called walls of water. Your grandparents, that's what they called them. You fill up these tubes with water, and then the water actually retains the heat and releases that in the middle of the night uh, when it gets chilly at night. Uh, it also, what it mainly does, I find, it keeps the frost off but it warms the soil up so that your plants want to root faster. So if you're gonna go with a bigger tomato, go, get, that's well worth the investment. And it will, it will up your game so that you get some fruit before that first frost comes. Anything bigger, okay? I generally go with a smaller, medium size. I like Celebrity, I like Champion, San Diego. Early Girl we love because that's the best. It's got a tart flavor to it. It's the best one in salsas. Uh, those are some of my personal favorites, and then you've got to have a cherry tomato. I love yellow cherry. I love yellow pear cherries because they don't go in the house. They just pop. You're in the garden, <laughs> communing, and you just pop them in. My mouth's watering right now. You just got to be Vincent. Oh yeah, we got a black lab that loves tomatoes. <laughs> Word of warning: This is a two-man job to put these up. No, I did it last year by myself. You turn a five-gallon bucket, guys, upside down over the plant. Put that over it, fill it up, and take the bucket out. Works out well. Okay. Yeah, it is too, man. It's kind of a messy thing. I'll keep, keep those on. What, I'll keep those on. I mean, they, they, they stand about this tall. Let's get it up where they can see that. The, the, the plant protectors stand about that tall. Once the plant is starting to come up, and it's starting, I, I might not get it off of there. Um, I'm starting to kind of gauge that. When do I take those off? Because they don't stay on year round. Um, uh, I, I, when the plant's coming up about uh, eight inches or so out of those plant, out of the water tubes, then I'll just slip it off, dump it out, leave it in the sun for a few days while they dry out, and then I scroll them away in the garage till the next year. Plant protectors really play out, not for your cool season plants, but mainly for your summer loving plants. <laughs> okay, do you think of a frost? I was looking at the temperatures next week, it's down to 33 one night. It could frost easily. Yeah. I predict it will frost. I, I don't think this this weather it never lasts. So I predict the average frost date is 
first week in May, I think if you're frosty, it's going to I don't know. We'll see. Depends on where you're at. A south facing hill, you probably won't. The north facing gardens, they probably will. So it just depends on where you're at. If you're at the bottom of the hill, where that cold air runs by the dry creek bed, you probably will frost. Higher up on the hill, probably not. It just depends on where you're at. I think it'll be spotty mm -hmm. when it happens. But if you don't want to take that chance, if you've already got your cute little veggies in the soil, using a plant blanket, protector blanket, just helps keep that edge off. Because usually when a frost is coming, you're kind of down frost. and then yeah, it's back up. Quick. So this kind of gives you that protection from that real quick freeze. Now, if it gets down below zero, it ain't gonna help. But those quick freezes that we get this time of year, it really just takes the edge off. Don't use plastic. Whatever you do, don't use plastic. Use burlap, a sheet, take your wife's, you know, your grandmother's hand quilted quilts. <laughs> take, use the something breathable. Don't use uh, plastics actually trap the cold in and does more damage. So you need it to be breathable. What you want, the great thing about these, they hit the open floss light on top of the fabric. Doesn't allow it to permeate down into the foliage. So it keeps the damage hit, it breathes, it warms up fast. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Should we talk about birds real quick? Quail are your enemy. <laughs> you don't even know they're there until you start putting carrots, lettuce, the seedlings in. They love seedlings. So some of you are going to need to protect those seedlings until they get up to size, and then the pressure's off. They like the new seedlings, whether it's sunflowers or whatever it is, they like seeds, so watch that one. Uh, bird netting, show that up. That works really, really well. I uh, put some stakes up over top of the ceiling, just kind of drape it over. Just keep the birds off. I've actually had, I have two ducks in our backyard. <laughs> ducks, ducks, mallards, husband and wife team walking <laughs> around the pond. What was that all about? There's nothing for them back there to eat. So I see, I see uh, the, the, dog the dogs out there. <laughs> Go get them. Go get them. <laughs> uh, but they, they'll, they're notorious for pecking away at stuff. So kind of watch that one. Uh, your, your, your fruits. Looks like it's going to be a good fruit year, especially for apples and pears, some of those things. Use bird netting to protect and keep the birds out. Um, we've had very good luck with scare tape yeah. on our peach trees. So this is a reflective tape that you hang down from the branches or from the uh, uh, cage. It flitters and scares the birds. So you get a tomato, they'll pick a hole in it. That'll scare them off. For our peaches, I have found, some personal experience, it's best not to put it on too early, or they get used to it. Well, not birds. I put it on about a week, 10 days prior to the fruit, when I think the harvest is going to be. I'll put it on then, just to start to see a little bit of color. Because they're eyeballing it like you are. They're going, oh, it's dinner time. It's almost here. Next week, I think we'll be, we'll be eating peaches. That's about the time you put it on. And it, it does scare them, and it really reduces the damage from birds. Dramatic. We've actually used this on our trailers to keep the dogs from eating. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that really works on that. Um, maybe we should touch just real quick on, because I know a lot of people are organic gardeners. Uh, so they're using companion plants Good. to kind of keep your insects away, the aphids and thrift, that type of thing. And you mentioned using the cedar bark, yeah. uh, which is excellent. But you can also use companion plants. A lot of people are familiar with using the marigolds. Uh, they have an odor. They have the, the, the aphids and that type of thing they just don't care for. Uh, so they're going to, it's not a hundred percent, but it definitely helps. And anything that helps, anything that helps is you want that, right? Because we don't want to do a lot of spray. We don't want to have to fight the insects. So companion planting for insect control, Companion planting to encourage pollinators, really important. Yeah. It's the new banana. <laughs> so those are some, you know, just some yeah. little, few little things, plus it just makes it prettier, it's prettier. Yeah. I think once you cover herbs too, but you've got them out there. Herbs are really good at, at companion planting and repelling as well. We don't think of that, but it's yeah. great luck with uh, herbs that you can even have alina, some of that right. stuff, hiding the, the scent of things mm -hmm. they like. Yeah, so great things to use, but I wish I knew why they didn't like herbs. Why do you like them? They don't. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, using the herbs in your veggie gardens or in your containers really can help cut down uh, with the nuisance of alinas, mice, that kind of thing. 
thing to remember about these guys is the majority, of, well, a lot of them are perennial. So they're going to come back year after year after year, which maybe if you have them in a pot, you could just move it. Or if they're in your um, raised beds, just kind of put them on the edges where it's okay. If they come back and it'd be easy to rework your soil. Because if you have them right in the middle, it's going to be a challenge to, to work your soil. Yeah, the north side, no, the east side of our house, we've got a typical two-story house. I dug out the back, you know, back, and there's, there's a basement underneath there. You walk straight in from the street to the upper levels, office, computers, extra bedrooms, downstairs. Uh, so we've got steps going down the east side of our, from the, from the garage down to the lower patios, and each step is an herb, different kind of herbs. So our herb gardens, which are maybe 15 steps, has herbs, and then you go through the cedar fence where the dogs are kept with big pots of herbs, rosemaries. It's very artistic, it's very pretty. I find that east exposure, that's one of the best gardening spaces. Early bright light, it's sunny till about noon, and then it's shaded. Boy, the plant, anything I throw over there just does exceptionally well. I also had very good luck underneath the trees. Um, we've got a huge juniper in the backyard. I'll plant things just underneath the edge of that, that branch of that juniper. I'll put the pump, giant pumpkins I grow out underneath there. The hydrangeas that grow out there. Uh, things that I put there because it has bright light in the morning, gets bright during the day, has bright light at the end of the day. That's like a magic spot uh, for us. Plus, it's over and overhang. Uh, we're famous for our hail storms in midsummer. So August basically is a, uh, your tomatoes and pumpkins are looking beautiful. And then a hailstorm comes and shreds every leaf off that plant. And then you got to it takes you three weeks to recover. So if I get some cover, it kind of helps protect, keeps that hail off and have less damage. Just rhubarb, it's a great spot. Uh, have less damage, better production. Uh, asparagus, not so much. Asparagus wasn't happy to be leaned out to the sun. Asparagus likes to be in full, 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 full sun. So just first things we've seen, and my gardens are the same as your gardens. Your gardens are the same as Chino Valley gardens. Chino Valley is the same as Prescott Valley. We're all the same. You know that, right? We're zone seven. That's it. <laughs> zone seven. A couple really quick things. Basil, basil lovers, um, watch your nighttime tents. Talk about a sissy plant. Yeah. Basil is it. So go ahead and get your plants, but I wouldn't necessarily put it in the ground right now. I might wait so I can move it inside if it got cold. Plant protectors make a, that's a game changer for basil. Yeah. I mean, if you look, if it goes below 50 degrees, it's, if you're cold outside, outside at two o'clock in the morning, so is basil. It's just the biggest yeah. wind ever. And then I just want to hit on potatoes really quick, oh, yeah. because if you haven't grown containers in a barrel, a big pot or a trash can, because, you know, to put them in, the, in your bed, you have to have a lot of room. Yeah. Uh, but if you grow potatoes in those big pots, you can have some wonderful potatoes uh, late summer, early fall when they come off. Yeah, we do ours in, uh, which basically potatoes, plant them now. We take a grower's pot, those plastic pots. It looks cheesy, but we just put them down below behind a wall where no one sees it, including us. Yeah. Uh, just we throw a potato in there, and then as it grows, we, we cover it with some soil. And as it, it sends off that vine, the backfill it, add more and more soil to the top of that pot is full. And then we'll let the plant just keep growing, producing potatoes. And then about Thanksgiving, we always have potatoes for Thanksgiving. In the fall, we just dump the potato out, the whole bucket, boom. Dozens and dozens and dozens of potatoes just like that. So easy. So it sure doesn't take a lot of space. Yeah. And you have a really good handout on that on the website. I can add, I can probably add that. I can add that to it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's not forget potatoes again. But yeah, there's a good one for growing potatoes. Okay. So like, we're out of time already. What else do we have? Just see, you got, rock, you got grapes. We grow exceptionally good grapes. Uh, if you got a fence, a lot of you have got that blocked wall. That ain't pretty, you know that, right? Block, it feels like I'm in Russia sometimes. Nothing but gray. Uh, you can soften that up if you're into edibles. Grapes, blackberries, raspberries is what we do with our cedar fence. We just put a trellis, plant a plant, and it's beautiful. Tremendous production uh, off your grapes, blackberries. Uh, this is a new raspberry. If you don't have a fence, you just have a patio and you like entertaining, 
This is a, a raspberry shortcake. It's a shrub. It doesn't vine. So we, we grow this one in our backyard in a, in a great big pot. It's pretty. Grandkids come over and we eat raspberries until we're sick. <laughs> Same with grapes. We'll come in with our grape harvest. We'll literally just sit down and just eat grapes. You can't eat grapes anymore. Talk about bonding of the uh, generations. They call him Garden Guy Junior. <laughs> we like hanging out together and driving the forklift. And anyway, strawberries. We've got a strawberry patch. Strawberries do exceptionally well here. Um, I think we could use these more for ground covers uh, instead of honeysuckles and some of those things. And so it tends, tends to run where that touches. It will form another strawberry. It keeps running throughout the garden. It does exceptional. And we don't have to cover them like we do in the Midwest. So you've got to put a big layer of straw or something over them here. You just kind of let them go. And we just don't get that cold here. Um, what else we got? Blackberries. This one's a thornless. No, this one's got thorns. It's Prime Jim. Oh, Prime Jim. Oh, this is good. This is a new uh, blackberry that produces on first year wood. Those of you who have grown berries before, you know, last year's canes will form this year's berries. It's complicated. How do you prune this thing? Uh, this one will produce fruit on this year's cane, and it will produce again next year on that same cane. So it takes all that guesswork out of uh, how do you prune it? Uh, peppers, grapes. I brought the grape out. That one? This one? Yeah, show them that. It's just because they'll, they'll like this one. But, but look, it's oh, got grape mustard. Is that exciting? <laughs> I get giddy over that. I don't know. I just, that's this a like Concord seedless grape. It is? Yeah. yeah. That's a good grape for you. Yeah. 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 And then uh, uh, bay leaves. We'll end with this. Uh, you folks out, we've grown this. Skull Valley. Skull Valley was a perennial. Uh, I think Prescott Valley out towards Mayer, Dewey, those areas that. 5,000 foot level and below, I think it would be perennial. I find it's not as perennially here at the higher elevations. So if you're in Groom Creek in those areas, it tends to frost out. So uh, right free, in the free pot, in the garage in the wintertime. Isn't that pretty though? Evergreen plant, bay leaves, you know, like Italian cooking, bay as an herb, and nothing eats this. In the Skull Valley, we had elk roaming around, uh, uh, deer, javelina. Everything left it alone. It's really great. With that, we'll take three questions. Ooh. But only three. Anything? Three. Okay, we're done. We covered yeah. everything. <laughs> That's good. Even this would be small. Yeah. Uh, the big. <laughs> we own a nursery, you know that, right? So, uh, but, but I did look, so, so maybe you could point out which ones would be. Probably about 18 inch. Okay. Probably minimal size. We grow trees. We've, our prettiest pot is it's a, uh, a glazed, beautiful glazed green pot. It's got a fig growing out of it. It's actually forming figs. And, I wanted to look Mediterranean, that was the, so there's art. And we've got creeping thyme going out over the edges. So it looks like it should be in Italy or something, or Spain, on the Mediterranean coast. It looks like that. But the thyme keeps the ants out of the figs, because ants love figs as much as you and I do. It so keeps them out, and then it just looks pretty. And so it's been in there for years and years and years. I thought it would die out. It's done amazingly well. Put the right plants together. So I'd say minimum 18. Some of them will be 18 to 20, it seems to be our main ones. The ones by the garages I mentioned, those are massive. But we want to, you got a good scale. I mean, things can look dwarfed in the wrong place. That's a big, big garage. Uh, we need some height to it, so we put that in some great big, uh, what do we put in that? Nandina. We just tried that. We had some spiral topiaries. They look great, but we got bored. We've been there like 10 years, and we're like, that's ah, enough of you. Let's plant something else. We just went different. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, big container. If you're talking like the, just the black growing containers, um, we have a recycle bin at the end of our gate, and a lot of times people just bring those big pots back. I clean it out, but yeah, you could grow in there as well. And take advantage of that too. It is, 
We recycle pots. So if you've got these old pots left, bring them back. Don't throw them away. We'll put them in the uh, garbage. We'll use those. Or we send them back to the growers, and they'll reuse them again. So as you leave, you'll see a big recycle. It says, recycle pots. That's a free-for-all. You are more than welcome to take whatever's in there or put things in. Just don't put your trash in. Don't put your trash in. <laughs> and any little six-pack things, just one gallon size and bigger is what, is what can be recycled. What was the companion plant to the figs? Uh, creeping thyme is what I used, just because it, it's I wanted Mediterranean look. But I think oregano. Uh, there's several you can put in there. You could put a fig with basil, and it would be fine. Oh, can you? But it, I think just an herbal thing. I was trying to keep the ants out, get a certain look that matched that big green pot. Okay. It's been in there for years and years and years. Yeah, in the back, back, back. You got a question too? Let's go in the very back first, then we'll get to you on uh, Facebook. I'm moving up to Highland Pines. Yep. That's still zone seven. Your zone seven. Yeah. I need to know about being up there. It just seems a lot No. So Highland Pines, you're up, you're up with higher elevation. You're on a ridge line. So just like a lot of folks, uh, the Prescott Heights area, they're up on a ridge line. Uh, just realize you have more extreme temperature change, and you've got some woodland areas, depending on where your lot is, a lot of pine trees. So you get more influence of aphids. You're seeing that right now up there. Some plugs can come in. Uh, we just saw our first grasshopper show up in the nursery. He was quickly pruned <laughs> into. Uh, there, uh, it's uh, right now. The, it's the uh, from the deserts. There's a migratory grasshopper. They're flying north, basically like birds. They're flying, going to to warmer climates or cooler climates, whatever. And they'll lay a few eggs, but they're not the ones that do the problems. And another month, we'll get the fry, the actual hatch. So by the end of May, June, uh, we definitely get a, you'll see a little tiny grasshopper, little tiny grasshopper, and they grow, and they grow, and they start to take over, and they can eat your birds. Not so bad out there, that's more the, the valley areas. Chino Valley and Paul, the people, people, oh, I don't know how you deal with the grasshoppers. Uh, but we'll have things, that'll be our summer the chickens. We got a product called No Low Bait. We'll have here shortly. N O L O. It's it's wheat laced with a virus that are deadly to grasshoppers. Only grasshoppers doesn't affect chickens or anything else. Just grasshoppers, crickets. So we'll have things like that that can help some of you all. That does does change things up. On Facebook, what they got? There's two things. Two. Number one. My this is our last class until June 16th. Okay. So for those loyal listeners, yeah. we're going to take a hiatus. Okay. And then the other thing is the ladybug release. Ah, okay. So uh, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, we have a ladybug release at 2 o'clock today. You got grandkids or kids? Yeah. It's, like, it's like Instagram. We're just young kids. <laughs> kids, young and old. Kid. It's so much fun releasing a grass. Uh, yeah, a grass. <laughs> <laughs> They crawl around. You got to tell the little kids, don't eat them. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of fun. It's a hoot. It's, it's an Instagram dream. And then our next class is June 16th. Don't quite have those solidified yet. We were doing that, but that's where our next scheduled class. We'll take about six weeks off. We'll be back at it. I'm sure you all will be, have a personal notice of here's the class schedule because you're one of our core students. So with that, we'll hang out. Answer questions if you just weren't, we didn't quite catch what you got. Feel free to look at the plants as you want. We'll kind of hang out with the vegetables for a bit until everyone kind of disperses. Thanks, y'all. Give it up for uh, Lisa.